Thank you to the organizers. Thanks to all of you for being here. And Tashi Dele. Tashi Dele is t a tradi traditional Tibetan greeting that means good fortune be with you. And I'm going to talk about ma using mathematics as a tool for understanding Tibet. I led a study abroad program there and took students. I'm wearing a chupa, which is a traditional Tibetan dress, which is what I used when I wore when I taught there. And what I'll do today is briefly give you the motivation for why I came up with this course, talk to you about the units that we covered, and give you a few final thoughts about it. So I'm at a liberal arts school with a very strong global focus. We have a very large international population. And I was leading a study abroad on Tibetan studies in India. That's kind of a lot of motivation to figure out a class on math in Tibet. Um, so I had some questions that I used to motivate things. First off, how can I connect the classroom experience to our location? And how can I use mathematics to create a cohesive experience for the students across all of their courses? Now, those are very study abroad specific questions. The second question, I think, is much more important. Instead of asking how can culture motivate mathematical learning, so instead of how can I do this thing that people find interesting and therefore trick them into learning math, how can math provide different insight into culture. So how can I take a cultural question, a mathematical tool, and get something new? So the first tool we used was fair division. And we were looking at the map of cultural Tibet, or t what Tibetans call Tibet, versus Tibet Autonomous Region and the parts of that cultural Tibet that are now part of China. And I asked them, what do China's choices about Tibet's division tell you about the values of China and or the Chinese government? So they had to examine the output of a fair division game and go backwards to determine the values of the players. And they also had to think about the limitations of using fair division as a model for this. The students examined a lot of things in the process of understanding this question, like the mineral resources, the water resources, cultural centers, where the population was spread out, the international reputation of the countries, and borders. And so by answering this question, they enhance their understanding of Tibetan history, Tibetan geography, environment, and politics. The second unit looked at Buddhist debate, and we used symbolic logic. So Buddhist debate is something that all of the monks are heavily trained in, and it's very formal and very rigorous, and also really entertaining to watch if you ever get a chance. So they had to translate a Buddhist debate into symbolic logic and analyze the relationship between Buddhist debate and symbolic logic. So the students had to meet monks and observe a debate, which was pretty easy for them to do there, and translate from Tibetan to English to logic, a little bit harder to do. But to do that, they had to really make decisions about how to understand a very non-Western set of beliefs and ideas and see the logic underneath it. So some of the factors they had to examine were issues of translation. And they really started to understand the differences of purposes in debate versus <coughs> logic and the similarities of the tools, and that there's actually a distinct overlap there. This enhanced their understanding of Tibetan language, Buddhism, and history. The next unit we did was to look at the newly formed democracy, now that the Dalai Lama no longer has a secular role. And the democracy is called the Central Tibetan Authority, the CTA. And they had to answer the question, does the CTA represent the people fairly in exile? Okay, so obviously we were looking at voting theory, and they were asking questions of the Speaker of Parliament. They were considering issues of apportionment and power, and how does that play out in exile. They had to examine a lot of things, such as the distribution of the population, both in Tibet and in exile, because both of those are tied to votes. They had to understand the role of religion in that culture and the religious sects of Tibet, because some of those are tied to votes. And they had to understand what's the point of the government in exile so that they could really figure out what it meant to be represented by such a government. So they enhanced their understanding of Tibetan government, history, values, and Tibet in exile. The fourth unit, which I imagine everybody is familiar with, is art and symmetry. So I won't say much about it. But they were really interested in the utilitarian nature of things that were still also art. So things like the gates in the area. Um, and they had to determine the role that symmetry plays. They also made some art. You see examples here. And this helped them understand the evolution of culture in exile, Tibetan history, Buddhism, and life in Tibet. 
So just a couple of quick conclusion, conclusions. The mathematics was very successful at providing deep insights into the culture. So they had what they got from their culture class or from their philosophy class, and this somehow gave something more. By examining this question with a different tool, they got something more. Great cross-cultural conversations happened because of the mathematics, so we had some government officials contact us. They were interested in some of the representation results that the students found. Um, we had conversations about how Buddhist debate could turn out to be like mathematics and be used to understand science or other subjects. Um, and the open-ended, real-world nature of these questions was incredibly motivating for students. And so while you can't do all the things if you're not abroad, I think these three points can be captured in any classroom um, in the United States or anywhere. So your gift will look like this here. It has Tibetan script. It says Tibet and it says India and G4, G12. Thank you for listening and I look forward to talking to you guys later. <laughs>